Uh, hi guys, uh, this is an early uh, broadcast and scheduled, it's supposed to be at nine o'clock my time, but I've just heard that the power is going out in about 75 minutes, so I thought I would try and make a little bit of hay while the sun shines, while the lights are on, uh, and so that's why we're going to get started. So. Um, it's also will give me a chance to kind of get going before the chat gets going. So anyway, good to see you guys that are here. I see we've got a new member. Good to see you, um, Madeline Biamonte. Welcome. So I just want to show you where we are in terms of the timeline. We are at that at this sort of section right over here. We we over there. And we need to get sort of to this point over here. And that's going to actually, although it doesn't look like much, it's going to take two or three episodes. And then we're going to jump a year into the future. We're going to skip that part of the year. And then we're going to resume from around about July 1883. And then time's going to move by pretty quickly. Although we do have these letters to get through as well. So that's the plan. And uh, we'll see how things uh, develop, um, you know, in terms of that plan. So uh, anyway, let's get started with today's letter. And today's letter is um, from about the 12th, around about mid-May. And um, I don't know if you guys remember, there was there were issues with Mauve, right? Where Mauve had sort of said certain things. And anyway, so that is where we're resuming. Um, not only Mo Tierstig's also not terribly happy with Vince Van Gogh. So um, the poll for this episode is who told Vince Van Gogh that he had a vicious character? Was it seen? And I see about um, half of you, almost half of you are saying that it's seen, this woman that he was living with. Um, um, also about 40% are saying Theo. Um, it's not C nor Theo, um, and then 12% saying Tierstig, 12% saying Mo. Well, we're about to find out who it is. Um, but what I want you to think about is, do you think that Vincent van Gogh was capable of being vicious, right? We tend to think of him as a harmless, troubled, sensitive artist, and do you think that there's any merit to somebody saying that he's vicious? And um, so that is a question I want you to keep at the back of your mind. Um, and I will then try and remember to address it a little bit later. Okay, so let's get going with today's episode. Um, I see I've got around about 86,300 subscribers. I'm not happy with that number. Um, I, I don't like the three. So hopefully this uh, live stream will bring it back down to two. Um, you know, it's really irritating. I, I get, I'm at 86,200. It goes up to three, and hopefully this episode will bring it back down. So if you're watching this and you're a bit iffy about being on this channel, please unsubscribe because I'm just over 86,300. Uh, and, you know, if you feel like art is just not your thing, uh, it's a great reason to unsubscribe. I just don't like being at 86,300. It's just like an ugly number. So um, if you're feeling a little bit like, ah, this isn't for me, uh, hit that unsubscribe button. Okay, cool. Esim Kovalinsky, good to see you here. Okay, so let's get going. Um, let's just bring up the letter. Okay, there we go. And let's blow it up a little bit more. Okay, so you can see this is all about Mauve. And so he starts off even before he says dear theo he says please feel free to tell mob anything you like about the contents of this letter but there's no need for it to go any further so it's kind of saying you welcome to tell mob what i tell you in this letter but he's also kind of saying you don't really have to um you don't really have to let the contents of this letter go any further and then he gets down to sort of brass text by the way, have a look at these um, these images that are related. This one is called Scene's Mother. So he's even painted Scene's Mother. It's quite interesting. 
and bent figure of a woman, and this is actually seen. So she looked terribly happy. And the next one is another bent figure of a woman. And then woman sewing, probably seen as well. Okay, so let's get started with the letter. Uh, Van Gogh writes, My dear Theo, I met Mauve today and had a most regrettable conversation with him, uh, which made it clear to me that Mauve and I have parted for good. He's basically saying, that it's the end of their sort of bromance. Bear in mind that Mauve has been a kind of a, a teacher. Mauve is an established artist and he's kind of been um, mentoring Van Gogh and now that has come to an end, right? And if you think about it, it didn't last very long, did it? The, the relationship barely lasted half a year before Mauve had, had enough of Vincent, right? Ricardo Ortiz says, you, you ask for the poses or do you think he asked for the poses or were they spontaneous? It's hard to say. It is a good question. So he's saying they parted for good. So it's obviously quite serious, the disagreement that they've been having. And he says, Mova has gone so far, gone too far to retract. And anyhow, he certainly wouldn't want to. Then he says, I invited him to come and see my work and then to talk things over. But Mauve flatly refused. He said, these are Mauve's words. He said, I will certainly not be coming to see you. That's all over. And in the end, he said, you have a vicious character. So there's the, there's the answer to the poll. So it's Mauve who said to him, you've got a vicious character. And again, I want you to think about, do you think Mauve was totally out of line? Do you think Moeb is totally unreasonable? Or do you think there's some uh, truth in that comment, right? And if you think about it, where could that co comment come from? So I just want you to think about on those thoughts, because we tend to think of Van Gogh as this harmless, kind, sweet, sensitive, legendary artist. But is there a part of him that's actually quite... Uh, cruel and merciless in a way, vicious basically. And so they were, seems like they were walking together and Moeb said to him, you, you've got a vicious character. And at that moment, Van Gogh turned away and they were in the dunes, I think it was at Scheveningen, and walked home alone. And so uh, the one artist turned his back on the other artist and then just sort of walked home alone. Uh, SM Kobolinski says, I wonder what caused him to say that. There must be an aspect of truth to it. Well, if you think about the context, the context is that Van Gogh has, you can to some extent say, say being kicked out of his family home, but you can also say he's turned his back on his parents. Um, there's also been the whole um, story with um, Key Boss that upset his entire family, and he persisted regardless of what they thought. But if you think about it in a very simple sense, Mauve and Tiestig are well aware that Vincent is taking a lot of money from his brother, and the, the whole time he's got a prostitute staying with him. So where do you think that money is actually going, right? And I think that word vicious is almost the extreme version of someone who's being incredibly selfish someone who's taking money from his brother and basically um, using that money in order to have a prostitute live with him like permanently. And although I don't think that's the full story, uh, Moeb is very disconcerted by this, very disappointed by this, and he sees it as very nasty to the other Van Gogh brother, right? He thinks Vincent's being a very bad son and a very bad brother to his fellow, you know, to, to his, his family, right? The other aspects as well, but, but we'll get to that. 
So Mauve, according to this letter, Mauve takes it amiss that I said, I am an artist, which I won't take back. So in other words, Vincent's response to basically Mauve's criticism is, I'm an artist. He basically says, whatever your criticism of me, well, I'm an artist. And I must say, I've had that a lot with my own brother, where if my brother's late or he does something that's strange, then that is just, well, he's an artist kind of thing. I, I don't get the same treatment. If I'm late, I'm not an author or an artist. I don't get the same thing. Anyway, Vincent van Gogh is asking for that kind of um, leeway, uh, that kind of, what's the word, credit in a way, and uh, Moab doesn't, doesn't grant that to him. And then he says, it's self-evident that what that word implies is looking for something all the time without ever finding it in full. It is the very opposite of saying, I know all about it, I've already found it. As far as I am concerned, the word means I'm looking, I'm hunting for it. I am deeply involved. So he's having these sort of existential conversations with Mauve about what an artist actually is. Then he goes on to tell his brother, he says, I have ears, Theo. If somebody says, you have a vicious character, what am I supposed to do? So this has obviously bothered him. You know, he's been insulted and it's bothering him and he's giving vent to to the comment. So he's he's now SM Kovalinsky was saying, you know, where does this come from? Well, Vincent is actually giving it in a way an explanation, right? SM Kovalinsky says, I knew a musician who always said that to excuse bad behavior. Yeah, to some extent it's true, but I think you can ride the coattails of that whole thing. Um and, and then it does allow you to get away with bad behavior. Um, anyway, so he, he says, I turned away and went home alone, meaning after Mo said that he was vicious, he just turned away, went home. And he said he had a heavy heart, a very heavy heart, that Mo should have been prepared to say that to me. Then he said, I shall not ask for any explanation, nor shall I apologize. And yet, and yet, and yet, I wish Moab did feel some compunction. I'm suspected of something. It is in the air. I'm keeping something back. Vincent is concealing something that mustn't see the light of day. Well, there you have Vincent speaking somewhat cryptically about why this is kind of in the offing, right? And it's things that we've been talking about already is that he is being suspected of doing something. Something is in the air. Um, he is keeping something back. Vincent is concealing something. And all of that is true. And Vincent's sort of um, playing with words here a little bit, as if to say, it's not that bad. Hi, Susan, good to see you here. So now he, almost like he's addressing an audience, he says, well, gentlemen, I shall say to you, you people who prize manners and culture, and rightly so, provided it is the genuine article, which is more cultured, more sensitive, more manly, to desert a woman or to concern oneself with who, who with one who has been deserted. So what do you think all of this is about? It's about a woman. And you have the same Van Gogh who insisted to his uncle and aunt and parents that his behavior towards Kivos wasn't inappropriate, even though she said no. He's now insisting to his fellow artists that his behavior towards this woman of the street is also appropriate, that it's his job to take care of her. It's his duty to be concerned with her, right? And um, of course, she would eventually desert him, which is quite ironic. Okay, so now he actually finally provides the, the story for what has been going on all along, right? And it's in this paragraph. But before we get to that, if you just go back here a little bit, where he says, I am keeping something back. He says, Vincent is concealing something. Well, this is what he's been concealing. And so this is the story. He says, 
last winter, which is really to say a couple of months ago, probably December, I met a pregnant woman deserted by the man whose child she was carrying, a pregnant woman who walked the streets in the winter. She had bread to earn, you'll know, you'll know how. I took that woman on as a model and have worked with her all winter. I couldn't pay her a model's full daily wages, but I paid her rent all the same. And thus far, thank God, I have been able to save her and her child from hunger and cold by sharing my own bread with her. Now, if you remember, and this is a little bit of a weird sort of path to go down. Do you remember Vincent also said that after, almost like immediately after Kivos, he had this um, soothing, intimate experience with someone. Well, it sounded like it was with Kivos. Well, wasn't she then pregnant at the time? Wasn't he pregnant? Wasn't she pregnant when he had this encounter with her, right? Uh, Karina, hi from Austria, good to see you. Then he says, when I first came across this woman, she caught my eye because she looked so ill. I made her take baths and as many rest, so and, and so also made her take as many restoratives as I could manage. And I guess that's some kind of medication, something like an aspirin or uh, some kind of medication that would make her uh, feel healthier. Then he said, I've been with her to Leiden where there is a maternity hospital in which she will be confined. And then there's an asterisk here, and that just refers to this part in the postscript where he says, small wonder she wasn't well. The child was in the wrong position and she needed an operation. The child had to be turned around with the forceps, but there's a good chance that she will pull through. She's due to give birth in June. Now, what that tells you is that she must have been something like three months pregnant when Van Gogh met her, right? Around about three or four months pregnant. Now, um, if we go back to that asterisk, so I think what's quite important to uh, emphasize here, hi Yvonne, good to see you here. Um, Karina, I hope you're doing well in, in Austria. I know your health wasn't that great. But what is important to emphasize here is Somebody had to pay for this prostitute going into hospital and getting some kind of medical intervention. Well, who do you think paid for that? And you might say Vincent van Gogh paid. No, actually, it was Theo. Theo actually paid for that. And you can imagine that that could have been quite expensive. And you can imagine that that would have set him back quite a lot in terms of his ordinary expenses. Then he says... It strikes me that any man worth his salt would have done the same in a case like this. I consider what I did so simple and natural that I thought I could keep it to myself. She found posing difficult, meaning seen, found posing difficult. Yet she has learned and I have made progress with my drawing because I have had a good model. The woman is now attached to me like a tame dove. For my part, I can only get married once and when better than now. So he's actually alluding there to marrying this woman. Can you believe it? So he's known her basically, what is it, um, four months or something like that, four months. And when he met her, she's pregnant with another man's child. And he's already ready to marry her. And I mean, he was ready to be the only, have key boss as the only woman in his life not that long ago. So it seems like Vincent's, desperate to kind of get married is suddenly gone from the borinage to wanting a woman at his side and wanting to live happily ever after so sm kovalinsky writes um, it sounds decent that he helped this woman certainly but i think mov and others could likely also see that there was something in it for him so she rejected him sad yeah i mean i think i think there definitely was something in it for him It seemed like, to some extent, a relationship of convenience. He got a certain amount of satisfaction, <laughs> excuse the pun, but and then he also got a model, whereas she got sort of a place to stay and someone who looked after her um, and a, a little bit of relief from the hard life that she was living. 
So then he goes on to say, um, it is the only way to go on helping her and she would otherwise be sent back by want onto the same old path which leads to the abyss. She has no money, but she's helping me to earn money with my work. I'm filled with zest and ambition for my job and my work, and the reason why I put aside paintings and watercolors for a time is that Merv's desertion gave me a great shock, and if he sincerely retracted, I should start again with renewed courage. At the moment, I cannot look at a brush. It makes me nervous. So this uh, gives you an idea of what can be upsetting to Vincent van Gogh what can make him feel um, so depressed, so upset, that it actually causes him to stop painting. And it's that, that is an attack on his character, someone telling him that he's vicious. Um, it, it may be true, but he will maybe respond to that um, sensitively, to his credit, right? So, Karina says, their relationship must have been complicated on all levels. Yvonne says, a tame dove, oh boy. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, so he writes on, he says, I wrote, Theo, can you enlighten me about Merv's attitude? He wants to know from Theo, what is going on with Merv? What is Merv telling him? And he says, perhaps this letter will help to enlighten you in turn. You are my brother. It is only natural that I should speak to you about private matters. Well, if you think about it, he hasn't actually spoken to his brother about private matters in months. And there's been a, there's, there's been a repeated lie. First, he lied about Kivas. He kept that a secret for about six months. And now he's lied about this as well, right? This is also something that has been private. So although he's saying it's natural to speak to you about private matters, well, he hasn't until he was forced to because of his falling out with Merv. So he's almost doing this in anticipation of Merv telling his brother something. And so by telling his brother first, he doesn't look so bad. Does that make sense? And then he says, really for the third time, he repeats what Merv has said to him. You have a vicious character. And he says, I don't feel like talking to him anymore. I don't feel like talking to someone who tells me I'm vicious, right? And then he says, again, he's still defending his, his act, actions. Um, so, you know, no one's going to say that what he did for scene wasn't kind. The problem is that he never told his brother. And the fact is that the burden of looking after scene actually shifted to his brother in terms of looking after her um, financially, right? And so the, the vicious part is that him actually doing that, having the, I guess, the perverse enjoyment of the circumstances and not telling his brother and nevertheless getting money from his brother, but under the pretext of I need it for painting supplies, I need it for um, rent or what, whatever. And that I think, I think he saw that as... Um, like viciously selfish as incredibly self-centered and mean and almost like psychopathic right um to do to be so manipulative of his own brother um in a way that was to a great extent to his own benefit and you must bear in mind she's a prostitute and so what these other men are thinking is that he's sleeping with this woman and they, they see the whole thing as very sleazy and very beneath someone from the Van Gogh family. Nisi, thanks very much. Um, Van Gogh group is the greatest. Thanks, Nick, and all um, you fabulous people. Thanks a lot for that, Nisi. Okay, so this is a fairly short letter, and then he adds a little bit of talk about um, uh, pictures that he's been painting, and he says, I'm sending you a few studies because you may perhaps see from them that she has helped me considerably with her posing. My drawings are by my model and me. And, and then he really goes through these pictures. And of course, he hasn't sent these to um, 
here until now because he would have to explain why are you painting the same figure over and over again, right? He probably felt he would need to kind of explain to some extent what is going on, you know, who these kind of figures are. And so now that the cat's out of the bag, well, now he sends this to say, this is what I've been doing. And I um, I, I don't know what you guys think. I, I don't think that's that's bad at all. I think he's rendered the chair very well. I think he's rendered the dress very well. Um, and with very few lines, is rendered her features pretty well as well. What do you guys think? If we go to uh, this one, I don't think it's as good, but it's it's also not too bad. And that one's probably not not uh, good at all, but it's um, yeah. This one I think is is really well done. You can see quite a lot of effort went into getting the textures right and the tones. Look how dark the dark is, that the shadows and so on is definitely quite well rendered. Lots of detail, also a lot of detail in her face. Okay, so let's go on to the next letter, and it's written around about the same time, fourth uh, of fourth to the twelfth of May. So between the first week and the middle of of May, eighteen eighty two. So how he, how on earth is Theo going to respond to this sort of latest eventuality? What is Theo's reaction going to be to this? You know, I've been paying for this. You know, what is, what's, what's going to be the result of that, right? Um, Ivan says facial structure good too. Uh, Karina says I'm not a fan of his portraits, but that one is very good. If you think about that portrait and the terrible portrait of Adeline Ravu, which he did like eight years later, it is actually quite amazing. Okay, so let's uh, bring this up. Okay, so dear Theo, if I told you some rather gloomy things about her in my last letter, it's because I want to state from the beginning that I'm not living in a garden of roses, but in reality. I think about that statement and the kind of things we've been covering in true crime over the past couple of days, especially about this whole idea of young people living in like a fictional life, especially related to their relationships and that kind of thing, right? Um, we've been dealing with that in the Petito case, in the Caitlin Armstrong case, um, and so on and so on. And and now we see it with Vincent van Gogh as well, where he says he's realized he's not living in a garden of roses, but in reality. And we know that he was actually living in a garden of roses for a long time, you know, when he was uh, studying the Bible, and he hadn't really experienced reality in a in a real sense. Well, now he is. Now he definitely is. And then he says, and because I want to protest against sentimental considerations in advance, for instance, like those father and mother would not fail to bring into it, if I asked their advice or merely told them the story. Sentiment and sentimentality are two very different things which they cannot distinguish between. And if I spoke of it, so you can see here, Van Gogh is definitely concerned what his parents are going to think about the situation. He's definitely concerned what Theo is going to tell his parents about the situation. Is he going to tell them? So he goes on to write here, if I spoke of it, if I spoke about what is really going on, he said, father, and their father is a pastor, would perhaps think he had to play the part of a gendarme, which is a policeman, it's a French word for a cop. And he said, which would be quite out of place and of little use. So you must excuse me if I don't say a word about it to father and mother and don't want them to interfere. So in his own way, he's kind of telling Theo um, that he's not going to tell his parents about what's going on. 
and I guess he doesn't want Theo to do the same either. He says, if father refused to give his consent, there are terms in the law which, as I am of age, guarantee my independence. But I don't think father will go so far as to oppose me. So he is actually citing the law and, you know, the fact that he's of an age where he can choose who he wants to be with. That's going to guarantee his independence. So you can see just how intensely and desperately Van Gogh is just trying to find a woman. He, he tried to find a woman with key boss, and that was a disaster. And now he's doing something that's arguably even more disastrous, but he's insisting on it, right? Thanks a lot, Karina. Ricardo Ortiz says, I, I gather Vincent was not too keen on superficial criticism regardless of who said it. I think it was just someone who really liked his own way, right? Anyway, he goes on to say that they would say, his parents would say, you are marrying beneath yourself and you are too poor. Well, he's, he's right about that. Um, he is too poor and yeah, so he says, my answer to this is, if I intended, thanks a lot, Susan. Uh, thank you to Susan and thank you to Karina. Thanks a lot for that. Um, what's, how do I make this disappear? Hide, okay. Um, so he says, my answer to this, to you know, you marrying beneath yourself. So now he's, he's already gotten to the point where he's saying, I want to marry this woman, right? And I think she's still pregnant at this point, and she's got another child. So think about it. It's uh, basically an unemployed artist, and the fact is he's going to remain unemployed and un unsuccessful for the next eight years for the rest of his life. And now he actually wants to marry a woman with a child already and another one on the way, and neither of them are even his children. And he thinks this is a good idea, right? Yvonne says, Vincent doesn't want to be judged poorly, but he knows his choices are controversial. I think it's a case that he just wants what he wants. As unreasonable as it is, he's desperate not to be alone, and he wants some, I guess, female companionship. And he doesn't really care what it is as long as he gets some kind of thing. Karina says, I think you are very right to say that Van Gogh wanted a woman near no matter the costs. His idea of love is a hint of desperation, always. Um, I mean, bear in mind, he's 29 years old, and this is really his first love, if you want to use those words, right? And this is why I've said that this is the untold story of Van Gogh, is that he has many very catastrophic crazy um, encounters with women, right? And that's part of Van Gogh's story that you don't really hear very often. And it doesn't end here. The, the craziness, with, craziness with scene isn't the end of the story. He's going to continue having inappropriate or, or attempting to have inappropriate um, dalliances. And that is why I say, wasn't that what he tried to do with Dr. Gachet's daughter after he'd been in an asylum for a year. And that was the first woman who was sort of hanging around. You know, it was the doctor's daughter who had the run of the house. The mother wasn't home because she, she had died. And so, and the doctor wasn't around because he was working in Paris. And Vincent was allowed to come and go to Dr. Gachet's house. And who was there except um, Marguerite Gachet? And so didn't he fall in love with her inappropriately, right? And isn't that circumstance the missing link into the strange scenario of, and all I'm trying to say is that theory is not nearly as strange as I think a lot of people think it is, that's all. Yvonne 
says Vincent marrying scene now would be like Brian marrying Gabby and living in a storage container. Well, it would be like Brian marrying Gabby, but Gabby's um, actually pregnant and she's got a a child as well, kind of thing. Um, and and Brian's thinking he's going to make a living selling four dollar bookmarks, and he's going to be able to look make have a family doing that kind of thing. Okay, so. He says, my answer to this is, if I intended to live in style, the result would be very bad. But as I intend to live in a house consisting of a studio, one room and a little kitchen with a bedroom in the attic, and as my way of living will be very simple, it can be done. And two persons living together can live more cheaply than one. So he's making the argument that the economics of their relationship make sense. Um, he says he will live simply and it can be done and they can live more cheaply than one. And in a way, that's a cliche. I mean, it's true. Two people living together can develop economies of scale, but that is assuming that both of them work. I mean, if two people who don't work, who've got to be looked after by a third party is more expensive than one person that's got to be looked after by a third party. And this is not just two persons living together, it's it's two persons living together, one of whom is pregnant and she's got a child. So he's not, again, he's, he's, he's being a salesman here, isn't he? Then he says in French something here, I'd love to hear Bria um, uh, verbalize that. On ne se dépérira pas, on ne se veut qu'ensemble. You are sure to perish alone, only together you can save yourself. Um, interesting words, uh, but is it really true? I mean, you can tell that Vincent is actually being completely unreasonable. Uh, he doesn't really have a hope in the situation. But what, what can one do? What can one do? So he goes on to say, I asked Key if she would risk marrying me. You know how I was refused. But the way I was received in Amsterdam was much worse than I led on. They told me I wanted to coerce her. She refused to see me, to speak to me, not during one visit, but during the three days of my stay. Theo, only those who misunderstand me completely would tell me, you are trying to coerce her. Well, it kind of was. He, he knew that she said no, and he was nevertheless um, exerting pressure on her. Right. Um, what I want to just again compare here is Van Gogh, um, just that horrible feeling where you love someone and you're not 100% sure of that other person's feelings towards you. And just what an unpleasant, what a nightmare that actually is when you've got really strong feelings towards someone and you want to marry them and you want to turn your, your life upside down for them. And then that person elects to not care about you or whatever it, it is. And, but I mean, I'm just trying to get to that, that thing of Van Gogh probably has very low self-esteem himself. Van Gogh probably um, is a lot like Brian Laundrie in a sense, right? Unrequited love. So then he goes on to say, what I'm doing now proves sufficiently that I didn't want to coerce Key then. I think what's quite interesting here is the fact that he brings up marrying Key, right? That he, he wanted to marry Key, now he's trying to marry somebody else immediately afterwards. Key obviously has an impact on, on what he's doing right now. It's almost like he wants to conjure a family. He suddenly wants to be married. He wants the wife and kids and the whole home situation. He wants it just to suddenly be there. It's kind of like magical thinking. Then he says, this woman whom I'm with now understands me better. In a short time, she became as meek as a tame dove. That's a, a second reference to her in that way. And he says, certainly not from my coercing her, but because she saw that I was not rough. Now, um, if you think about it, it's not entirely, or, I mean, let's, let's ask it as a question. Is uh, Van Gogh, is, is Key 
sorry, not key, is seen um, completely volunteering to be with Van Gogh in the, in the situation. And the answer is she's pregnant and because of her kind of job and because she's got another child, she's on in very rough times. And I don't think Van Gogh met her like he was sitting in a park innocently. I think he was looking for like a woman of the night and he came across her. And then one thing led to another, right? So I don't really think it's a question that there is no coercion there. I think she's coerced to some extent by the money. Um, and he is seeing all sorts of opportunities in terms of the um, the posing and you know hitting two birds with one stone. Coercion may be a strong word, but it, there is a sense of, I mean, is is seen free to leave? And the answer is because she's sick and because she doesn't have money, she isn't free to leave. Is Van Gogh? I'm not saying he's holding her prisoner, but is he kind of taking advantage of her? Is he kind of taking advantage of her situation? Well, it kind of feels like that, doesn't it? So he goes on to say, well, this one has understood. And she said to me, I know that you haven't much money, but even if you had less, I would put up with everything if only you stay with me and let me stay with you. I'm so attached to you that I could not be alone again. If someone says that to me and shows by everything in deeds more than in words that she means it, then no wonder that with her I drop the mask of reserve, almost of roughness, which I've worn so long because I did not want to flatter. And has this woman been the worst for it or have I been the worst for it now that things have turned out as they have? I'm quite astonished to see her become bright and more cheerful every day. She's so changed that she seems quite different from the pale, sick woman I met this winter. Yet I've not done so much for her. I only told her, do this or that, and you will get well again. She hasn't thrown my advice to the winds. And when I realized this, I, I tried even harder to help her. Perhaps I can understand her better than anyone else because she has a few peculiarities which would have been repulsive to many others. First, her speech. So now he's talking about things about seeing that, that aren't very attractive. He says, her speech is very ugly and is a result of her illness. Then her temper caused by a nervous disposition so that she has fits of anger, which would be unbearable to most people. So you basically have a situation where Van Gogh is, I think, quite an anxious person, quite a nervous person, quite an intense person. And now he's staying with someone who is also has a nervous disposition. Does that ring a bell? Um, then he says, I understand these things. They don't bother me. And until now, I've been able to manage them. On her side, she understands my own temper. And it is sort of a tacit understanding between us not to find fault with each other. So you kind of get a sense that there's some kind of codependency taking place here, don't you? Um, where Van Gogh is, I guess, emotionally codependent. He's, he's just desperate to be in a re relationship with someone. And she needs help at this point. And so there's, you know, neither of them are independent. I mean, Van Gogh doesn't have any money. So he, he's already codependent on his brother. Well, he's, de he's dependent on his brother. I wouldn't say codependent. Um, so that's, that's kind of the situation. Karina says, I agree with him taking advantage of her based on her situation. So he goes on to say, um, he, he refers to a large drawing called the deserter. And then he says, Every day she learns how to pose better, and this is so. This is worth so much to me. She's no trouble, no hindrance, but she helps and she works with me. She has no pretensions, wanting this or that. When there's nothing but bread and coffee, she puts up with it and doesn't complain. So all of that has been a long pitch to his brother to say, uh, to explain, to say this is a good person. There's nothing wrong with the situation we're in. 
and just sort of highlighting all the pros. These are all the good sides to it. Okay, I've got about half an hour left. So Van Gogh then goes on to say, but Theo, I'm pining to see you and speak to you. I'm also longing for a letter. But if I knew that um, you would not turn your back on me for this reason, I should be as happy as a man can be. He's basically saying, Theo, I've been honest with you. This is the reality. If you can not turn your back on me, I will be um, you know, as happy as a clam. Um, that will really make my day. He says, it's true that at first I shall need some help. If I should have to do without it, it would be very bad indeed for me. Now, obviously, what do you think he's talking about when he says help? Um, he's talking about money. He's saying, I'm going to need help from you. But of course, the money, the, the help is financial help. Then he says, but that help need not be more than I received when alone. And my energy increases. And although I've been trying hard to get ahead, of course, I'm trying even harder now, if I may count on your help and sympathy a little longer. So when he says count on your help and sympathy, he's really saying, I'm counting on your money and your sympathy for my situation to give me money, to continue giving me money. He says, I will succeed in earning what's necessary through the sale of my work. I, um, and the answer there is no, he won't. He won't succeed. He won't earn what is necessary. But he's kind of doing the whole salesman thing for his brother for you know to to make sure that this continues then he says the first step i should like is to to take is to rent the house next door about which i wrote you as soon as she comes back from Leyden, i will marry her without telling anyone quietly and without any fuss then we shall then we should be glad to have that house we are prepared to live as simply as possible now, if you just think about that in a simple way, Van Gogh basically wants a house now and he's going to marry someone and his brother must look after him, but within a marriage situation, um, yeah, you know, and it's it's now becoming kind of quite crazy. It's like, um, well, now, and obviously he's saying, you won't have to look after us for very long because I'm going to earn my own way. And obviously that's not going to happen. But can you see how Van Gogh has sort of lost the plot? He's, he's actually gotten kind of cuckoo. It's a cuckoo thing. I mean, um, it just doesn't, it's not going to, doesn't make any sense. There's no way it's going to happen. So then he says, and if you could come and see for yourself, you would realize that you can count on both her and me working as hard as we can. I wish your confinement were over. So actually right now, he's not really even living with her. I think she's in the hospital. And I mean, that's, I think, an expense on its own. Yvonne Phillips says magical thinking. So he says um, a heavy ordeal is still ahead of her. But so far, everything has gone well since the visit to Leyden. But neither she nor I is living in a rose garden or dreaming in the moonlight. We have a hard time ahead of us, so much the better. Now, if you think about that, um, he says, neither she nor I are living in a rose garden or dreaming in the moonlight. But then if you go back to the real, the beginning of the, the letter, he also says, I'm not living in a garden of roses, but in reality, but he is, he is living in a, in a, in a rose garden. I mean, he wants to get married, get a house and he doesn't, he's not making any money. He hasn't proved himself yet. And yet he thinks that he can just step into this, this life because he wants to. He says, I certainly hope you won't take this in a melancholy way. So he's saying, he's saying to uh, Theo, you know, I hope you're not going to be saddened, disillusioned, disappointed by this. He says, of course, if Key had only responded a little to my feelings, this wouldn't have happened. 
that's a little bit of a guilt trip he's doing there. Don't you agree? He's kind of saying um, if Key had, and there's a bit of coercion as well, he's sort of saying if Key had responded to me, then this situation would have happened, wouldn't have happened. That's not really fair. I mean, Key's allowed to reject him. He can't force her to accept him by putting the family in, in an even worse light, right? So he goes on to say, but during my visit to Amsterdam, I had such a definite refusal that there wasn't the slightest chance of winning her unless my financial circumstances changed totally in a short time. So it seems like he was assured that the only way that there was a hope in hell for him to be a potential suitor was if he could sort of magic some kind of financial um, resources into being kind of thing. Anyway, he says, now, this will not happen now, for though I shall eventually earn so much, <laughs> he says, for though I shall eventually earn so much that this woman can live on it with me, it will not be enough to keep up a social standing. Besides, I don't have the slightest inclination or longing for it. And I, I guess that's true because he never achieved much sort of social standing, although you, you know that he appreciated the, um, how can you, how can one say it? He appreciated the clout of social standing. I mean, the portrait of Dr. Gachet, which became world famous, which became arguably his most important painting was a portrait of a, a person of some social standing, arguably the most important portrait Van Gogh ever painted. Anyway, he goes on to say, I don't have the slightest inclination or longing for it. You know what I want? Just enough to live on, but I don't care for more than that. What I should like best would be to have fixed weekly wages, like any laborer for which I should work with all my energy and, and strength. Now, if you think about it, Vincent wants his cake and to eat it. What he should really do is say, you know what, I really want to be with this woman. I'm going to take responsibility for it. I'm going to go and get a job. I would really like to be an artist, but I'll, I'll put the art to one side and develop that over time. But right now the priority is I've got to make money. I've got to be accountable. I can't expect my brother to pay for all of this. I've got to make money now. And... Um, we will put art on the back burner and, um, you know, I'll, I'll still draw, but what I need to do now is take care of this family. I need to be a breadwinner. But instead of doing that, he basically says, guess what? I want the family. I want the house. I'm not going to give up on the art, even though I haven't really proved myself. And guess what? Theo, you're going to pay for it all. Thanks a lot, bud. Right? So, he goes on to say, um, oh, by the way, hi, Lizelle, good to see you. He goes on to say, being a laborer, I feel at home in the laboring class, and more and more, I will try to live and take root there. Okay, well, great, then why don't you become a laborer? Uh, labor then, right? Earn some money, and then you can you know, do your thing. Then he says, I cannot do otherwise. I do not want to do otherwise. I cannot understand any other way. A do, a handshake. Yours sincerely, Vincent. Okay, so let's go on to the next letter. 12 or 13 May. So all of these are around about the same time. So you can imagine all of these letters are dealing with the same thing. It's trying to convince his brother that, that his plan is going to work, right? It would be really interesting to, to see the letters that Theo wrote back to Vincent, wouldn't it? Anyway, it says, Dear Theo, today I sent you some drawings and sketches. What I want to show you, first of all, is that what I told you about does not keep me from my work. So he is trying to reassure his brother that I'm on the job, right? I'm, I'm, I'm at full steam ahead. Even though all of these things are taking place, I'm focused. I'm fully focused. Then he says, on the contrary, I'm literally absorbed in my work and enjoy it and have good courage. 
Now I hope that you will not be angry at my saying so, but I'm rather anxious because you have not yet answered. And you can kind of imagine that. You can imagine that what is, what is his brother supposed to say to all of this, right? What is his brother supposed to say? What is his brother supposed to begin to sort of answer in terms of all of this? Then he says, I do not believe that you will disapprove of me being with Christine, right? So her nickname is Seen, but anyway, that's her name, Christine. She says, I do not believe that you would completely desert me for such a reason or for appearance's sake, or I do not know what else. But after what happened with Mervyn and Tearstick, can you wonder that I sometimes think with a certain sadness, perhaps he will do the same. So right now, the anxiety is growing. Van Gogh is very worried. Is his sponsor going to abandon him? What is his sponsor going to say about all of this? What is, is his brother going to support him through this, this test, right? Susan says, I think they were both living in poverty, but both hoping Theo would send more as a couple. So I wonder what you guys think. Do you think if you were in that situation, if you were helping a sibling and your sibling told me, I'm staying with a pregnant person and they've got, also got another child with someone else. I've been with them for three or four weeks, taking your money, thinking that I'm using the money for something else. Uh, we want to get married now. Can you keep sending us money? How would you feel? What would your response be? Uh, Yvonne Phillips says, do you think Theo should have stopped sending money to see Vincent could have made the adjustment and learned to support himself? Uh, it's a good question, but I think that question was preempted by the fact that within about a month or two, Vincent was in hospital. So if Theo th thought like, you know what, this is enough, There's, you know, I can't do this. Well, the next thing Vincent would be in this emergency situation, he'd be in hospital, and then they would rally to his support kind of thing, right? SM Kovalinsky says, I would think it was not something I would commit to. And that just shows you what kind of, I mean, the tests, the strains, the challenges Vincent made to his brother. It, it wasn't just it wasn't just that Theo was a the sort of um, beatific this this generous wonderful soul. His brother was quite a um, a testing fellow, right? Quite a testing person. Then he says. At least I'm eagerly waiting for a letter from you, but I know that you, undoubtedly you are very busy and it is not so very long since you wrote. But perhaps sooner or later you will experience it yourself when you are with a woman who is with a child. A day seems like a week and a week longer than a month. And that is why I write you so often these days, as long as I have no answer. So I don't know if you picking up what's going on is, He's really desperate for an answer, but he's also desperate for money. He's desperate that he's desperate to get to the point where his brother says, "Okay, well that is really shocking. Okay, well here's the next fifty francs kind of thing," and instead his brother is just not writing back at all. Then he says, "I wrote to you about intending to take the house next door, it being more suitable than this one, which seems to get blown apart so easily." But surely you know, don't you, I don't ask imperatively for anything, whatever. I only hope that you will remain to me what you were. I do not think I lowered or dishonored myself by what I did, though perhaps some will think so. I feel that my work lies in the heart of the people, that I must keep close to the ground, that I must grasp life at, in its depths and make progress through many cares and troubles. I can't think of any other way. I do not ask to be free from trouble or care. I only hope the latter will not become unbearable. And this need not be the this need not be the case as long as I can work and keep the sympathy of people like you. In life, it is the same as in drawing. One must sometimes act quickly and decisively, attack a thing with energy, trace the outlines as quickly as lightning. 
This is not the time for hesitation or doubt. The hand must not tremble, nor must the eye wander, but remain fixed on what is before one. And one must be so absorbed in it that in a short time, something has been brought onto the paper or the canvas, which is not there before, in such a way that later one hardly knows how it was hammered off. So I must say, at the same time that this seems ludicrous behavior, we are talking about someone who will become a world famous artist. And I think part of the craziness, part of the part of this incredible roller coaster story is why Van Gogh is this incredible character. He's not just some somewhat intriguing character. He's very uh, very much off track at times. And that makes him, you know, if at least a very colorful character, right? But if you think about these words he writes here in the middle of this debacle, this inappropriate fiasco, think about these words that echo through time to us and reach us where we are now. And the fact is that his art did stand the test of time, that he did end up becoming this incredible success story uh, post posthumously, but uh, post, sorry, posthumously, but nevertheless, he did. So when he talks about, um, I don't know whether he's talking about life or art or both, but he's saying the hand must not tremble. Um, one must be so absorbed in it that in a that in a short time something has been brought onto the paper or the canvas which was not there before in such a way that later one hardly knows how it was hammered off. And that is exactly what he does achieve, ultimately. He paints incredibly quickly, and he creates some of the most memorable artworks in the world, right? So that's the other side. You've got the side to Van Gogh that is chaotic and messy and um, disorganized and distasteful even. And then there's the other side that's magical and amazing and um, and sort of hard to believe that because it's so incredible, right? So anyway, it goes on to say, to act quickly is the function of a man and one has to go through much before one is able to do it. The pilot sometimes succeeds in using a storm to make headway instead of being wrecked by it. Now, what he's talking about here is that I mean, if you think about it, how, how long he spent studying and how long he spent in the Borinage where nothing really happened, right? Um, I think all of that is catching up to him. Bear in mind, he's 29 years old and he's about to turn 30. And that's got to be figuring in his mind, right? Bear in mind, in the end, he would only live to be about 30, 37 years old. So he's got eight years left to live. He doesn't know that. But even his his younger brother only has about five years, um, well, uh, it's also eight years left to live, but he's, he's only going to live to about 35 years old. And then his youngest brother as well, um, none of them are going to live very long lives. And he's feeling that his life is running out. And in a way, there's a healthy narcissism behind that. I mean, the way that he's applying it is maybe questionable, but there is something healthy about, I can't carry on not living. I've got to make my life count. I've got to, things need to start happening. And he's desperate for that to take place. And I think a lot has got to do with the fact that he's 29. That that, that number is speaking to him, you know, about the, the clock is ticking. I need to get going. And even if he hasn't achieved something in a work sense, I think he wants to achieve something or he wants to be somewhere in a familial, social um, sense in terms of, you know, uh, personal relationships, private relationships, intimate relationships, right? So if you think that there's some insanity going on with Van Gogh, I think it's that that sort of pressure that he's taken upon himself that I've got to be alive right now and, and he's just desperate to find some way 
for that to be the case. Whereas if you look at um, Brian Laundry, for example, he was caught up in that whole, I've got to be engaged. And that was making him act in a crazy way as well, right? So I need to really be quite quick now. I've got about 10 minutes left. So he goes on to say, what I wanted to say to you again is this. I have no great plans for the future. If momentarily I feel rising within me the desire for a life without care, for prosperity, each time I go fondly back to the trouble and the cares, to a life full of hardship, and think it is better this way. I learn more from it. It does not degrade me. This is not the road on which one perishes. I am observe, I am um, absorbed in my work, and I have confidence enough so that with the help of such as you, Moab, Tierstick, though we disagreed last winter, I will succeed in earning enough to keep myself not in luxury, but as one who eats his bread in the sweat of his brow. So that's the other thing is in the midst of this opprobrium with Tierstick and Moab, now there are now these two men who disapprove of him. He's really leaning on his brother. Now, what does his brother do? He's fallen out of favor with his parents, with his uncle and his aunt, with Moab, with Tierstick. What is his brother to do? So he goes on to say, Christine, that's a reference to seeing, says, uh, she's not a hindrance or a trouble to me, but a help. If she were alone, perhaps she would succumb. A woman must not be alone in the society and during a time like the one in which we live, which does not spare the weak, but treads them underfoot and crushes a weak woman under its wheels when she has fallen down. Therefore, because I see so many weak ones trodden down, I greatly doubt the sincerity of much of what is called progress and civilization. I do believe in civilization, even in a time like this, but only in the kind that is founded on real humanity. I think whatever destroys human life is barbarous, and I do not respect it. Well, enough of this. If it might be that I could rent the house next door and could have regular weekly wages, that would be delightful. If it cannot be, I will not lose courage and will wait a while longer. But if it can be, I should be so happy and it would save much of my strength for work, which is otherwise absorbed by cares. You will see there are all kinds of drawings in the portfolio. Keep whatever you think best of what I send. Then you can show them whenever there is a chance. And I should like to get the rest back sometime or other. If I thought you would come soon, I would, of course, keep these things until you came. But now it is perhaps as well for you to see the things together. And I hope that from it, you will see that I do not live idly on your money. Considering it superficially, you would perhaps view the affair with Christine quite differently from what it really is. But when you have read this letter and the previous one, it will be easier for you to understand. So he says, um, I wish those who mean well by me would understand that my actions stem from a deep feeling and a need for love, that recklessness and pride and indifference are not the springs which move the machine. And this step is proof of my taking root in a lowly station on the road of life. I do not think I should do well to aim for a higher station or to try to change my character. Um, I must say, um, that's in a way credit to him, the fact that he accepted that he would live a humble life his whole life, that made him a very hardworking artist. If he demanded um, luxurious accommodations and so on, he probably wouldn't have lasted very long as an artist, he probably wouldn't have gotten um, much or, or very long support, he wouldn't have gotten that much patronage from his brother. So in other words, the fact that he was willing to bite the bullet, as it were, uh, gave him this long eight-year span in which to, um, you know, create works that would become part of um, art history uh, for, for, for man, right? 
anyway, it goes on to say, um, I must have much more experience. I must learn still more before before I shall be ripe. But that is a question of time and perseverance. Excuse me. Adieu, write soon. If you can send me something, I will certainly not be unwelcome. Believe me with a handshake. So, you know, he is still desperately wanting money, but he's trying to not be too much on the chin about it. Then he says, in a postscript, he says, if I thought my leaving The Hague would please anyone, I would do it and go anywhere rather than be in anybody's way. But I do not, I do no harm to anybody after what you wrote me. I suppose I must not take what Tierstick said too seriously. So I suppose what his brother said to him is, don't take what Tierstick said too seriously. You know, like you must earn your own bread or something like that. So that to me is really what his brother needs to be telling him is, you know, you need to try, can't you find like a half day job? Can't you get some work somewhere? You know, can't you be part of the solution here? Then he says, the house which I wrote you about is for rent now. And I'm afraid someone else will take it if I don't do it soon. So again, he's pressurizing Theo, right? Um, Yvonne, thanks very much. Yvonne says, like Vincent, let us never lose courage. Thanks a lot for that. Um, well, he certainly does have courage, whether it's a fool's courage, I'm not sure. Anyway, he says, um, so you can see he's really hopping on this, this other house. And he's really want, waiting for Theo to give him the go-ahead to rent this place. And so he says, um, he says, for you will understand after what happened with Merv and Tearstick and after what I told you about Christine, I must ask you frankly, Theo, will these things cause a change or separation between you and me? So, you know, he's trying to get a straight answer from Theo. Theo, what do you think about what I've told you? What is your position? And we're going to find the answer to that in the next episode. So he goes on to say, I would be so happy if they don't. In other words, if these things don't cause a change and will be twice as glad of your help and sympathy as before. If it does, it is better for me to know the worst than to be kept in suspense. I think you'll agree with me that Van Gogh is quite a good writer, even when he's writing about things that are crazy. He does it in a way that's kind of charming and you do kind of feel for him. Right, he's quite a good writer, I guess. Um, if maybe not a very good at the real world, right? So anyway, he goes on to say, um, well, I must really wrap up. Uh, I would be so happy if, if they don't and would be twice as glad of your help. Then he says, I like to look things in the face, whether adversity or prosperity. I have your answer on the problem of Merv and Tearstick, not on the other one. That is something quite apart. There is a barrier between artistic and personal matters, but it is right to settle how we look at those things beforehand. And therefore I say to you, Theo, I intend to marry this woman, right? I'm going to wrap up now in the next two, three minutes. If unfortunately this should bring about a change in your feeling toward me, I hope you will not withdraw your help without giving me warning sometime in advance. He's saying, if, you can, if you're going to have a change of heart or a change of mind, please warn me that I know. And he says, and that you will always tell me frankly and openly what you think. Of course, I hope that your help and sympathy will in no way be withdrawn, but that we shall continue to join hands like brothers, notwithstanding things with which the world opposes. So, brother, if you have not already written when you receive this letter, answer me by return post, for after the things I wrote you, I must be reassured or must know the worst. So saying, Tell me, tell me the truth. How do you feel about this? Then he says, adieu. I hope the sky will remain clear between you and me. And then that is it. So I'm not going to take it further than that. I want to thank everyone for being here. Uh, thanks a lot for your super chat. We'll do the next letter on the 14th of May, and we'll deal with a letter from Theo. What is Theo's response to all of this? So that's definitely going to be quite interesting. So again, thanks to all the members. Uh, thank you to 
um, the new members who've signed up as well, I think you'll agree that this is something that you do need to spend a little bit of time on because it's quite a big dramatic event in Vincent's life. I better sign off now. It's got about two, three minutes before the lights go out. They don't always go out, but uh, I'd, let, I, I'd hate to sort of leave everyone hanging. So anyway, good night from me. Take care, sleep well, and I'll see you guys next time.